Malvaceae, the mallow family, or as I always think of it, the cotton family. These are uh, worldwide um, species, um, however, is especially common in tropical and subtropical areas. Uh, quite a few of them do not tolerate uh, much of any cold conditions at all. They're uh, interesting plants in that they often have uh, mucus canals and glands in their stems. Um, the flowers are uh, often quite showy. They usually have five petals and sepals with nectaries in there, and often the uh, stamens will form a tube uh, surrounding the pistil, so there's this big dramatic um, thingy sticking out of the middle of the flower. Uh, the fruits are interesting, often a schizocarp, sometimes capsules, nuts, berries. There's uh, quite a, an unusual collection of uh, species, uh, hibiscus, cotton, okra, cacao, which uh, chocolate's made from, hollyhocks, uh, linden are trees, uh, Chile Americana, also called basswood, and uh, a tropical fruit called durian. Here's an example of uh, the characteristics. If you've seen a hollyhock, uh, you can probably identify the Malvaceae, this uh, very distinctive five um, disconnected petals, uh, oftentimes um, uh, showy but sometimes reduced, and with this long protuberance in the middle, which is a combination of anthers and stigma. So if you see five separate petals, a column of stamens surrounding a pistil and a mucilaginous plant, uh, your first guess should be it's a member of the Malvaceae. This is uh, in the order Malvales, with about 200 genera and 2,300 species. The taxonomy is a mess. People are going to the mats arguing about uh, what should be what in this family. Um, there are, recently, they've been combining families into um, the Malvaceae that had been um, uh, independent families for quite some time, but now that they can look at DNA, they're figuring out uh, relationships. We're over sort of on the upper right in the rosid group, um, not quite as advanced as some of the plants that we've looked at, but uh, still in the true dicots. Notable species, cotton, obviously that's um, a very important um, uh, plant economically. Jute is uh, somewhat similar. Uh, Kenaf and Kapok are, and durian are all uh, tropical um, species that are um, very important in the regions where they're indigenous. Okra is um, uh, very widely used and grown uh, in the south in the U.S. and uh, elsewhere in the world. Cacao makes uh, chocolate, so uh, you can estimate how important that is. Uh, cola, there is actually um, uh, a nut called uh, Cola nitida that um, is, uh, was the original um, source for um, cola in Coca-Cola, but, um, and of course Coca-Cola doesn't tell you the recipe, but uh, it seems to be that it's no longer uh, used, that something that has a similar taste is used. Uh, balsa wood, you know, where would we have um, model airplanes if we didn't have balsa wood? Hollyhock and Rosa Sharon are very important horticultural species, and then the linden or basswood tree is um, an important landscaping plant. Here's a look at uh, several different Malvaceae flowers, and you can see they all have that same characteristic of uh, uh, five petals uh, that are not united, and then a very uh, distinctive central um, unit that's a combined uh, stigma and stamens. Here's cacao. Who knew? Look at those footballs growing right on a tree trunk. Um, it's a little evergreen tree that likes a little shade. It's native uh, to northern Mex Mexico and the Amazon. Of course, due to in, in, uh, interest in chocolate, it's uh, much more widely grown nowadays. The flowers grow straight from the trunk, uh, which is called cauliflory. These are pollinated by tiny little flies, so they do produce nectar to attract their flies. These big old fruits weigh about a pound when they're ripe, um, but it's the beans inside that uh, they get the chocolate from. And um, people have been doing that for at least um, uh, three, four, five, 5,000 years, and probably longer if, uh, uh, when you consider how nice chocolate is. Uh, the beans were actually used for currency at one point in time, and I uh, didn't get to uh, the Europeans until after Cortez found it in uh, 1519 when he started his attack on the Aztec Empire. Here you can see some pictures of the, the flowers uh, growing uh, straight off of the stems. And then uh, on the right is a mature fruit that's been cracked open. You can see how large they are just by the fact that uh, the man's hand is uh, needed to span the, the width. Um, they, today there's over 17 million acres in production, which if it was all in Iowa, it would be half of Iowa. 
There's uh, three and a half million tons a year produced, especially in tropical areas, uh, since this plant uh, does not, uh, below 72 degrees, it's uh, not happy. You get uh, an, a range of those pods per tree. Uh, about 10 of them will give you a, a kilo of cocoa paste, which is like baker's chocolate, the unsweetened chocolate. A lot of diseases, very subject to a different fungi. Um, in some cases, up to a third the crop is lost annually. And uh, the seeds do contain uh, teobromine, obviously named after the genus teobroma, which is uh, quite similar to caffeine. The uh, another, if I missed a slide there or not, no. Um, another really interesting fruit, I think this may be about my favorite genus, is um, something called durian, uh, durio zybenthinus. And actually there are quite a few different um, genera that are used um, uh, for this fruit. It's very popular in Southeast Asia. It's called the king of fruits by the people there. Uh, some of the descriptions of uh, people when they first uh, eat it, it's um, uh, obviously very, very um, attractive uh, flavor. However, uh, that's crossed by that the um, smell of this plant is uh, so bad that uh, it's actually, you can see here, no durians on the, the lower right, you know, no eating or drinking. This is a sign on the edge of a train. No smoking, no flammable goods, and no durians. So uh, how anybody ever decided to taste it if it smells uh, so bad, it's uh, a good question. It's been described with a really wide range of taste, everything from onion and garlic to vanilla and custard and... Um, uh, hard, uh, I suppose like anything, hard to exactly say what something tastes like. It's a very thorny husk, um, very difficult to um, get open. Uh, I've watched uh, several videos trying to find just the right one to, to embed here, and uh, it is kind of a, a trick to get these things open without destroying the insides. Additionally, they're only ripe um, for a fairly short amount of time, so they don't ship or uh, hold very well. And with any luck, I'll play you this little uh, YouTube video. Here in Malaysian Borneo, a seasonal invasion is underway. Staff at hotels watch nervously for a food that is putrid, wretched, and loved by millions. Meet the durian fruit. Their smell is hard to describe. It smells like a rotten fish and custard. A rubbish dump. Blue cheese. Perhaps a dead dog like private parts. Other cultures love foods that smell strongly. Cheese, a favorite in the West, is actually rotted milk, a stench people in Asia find intolerable. Like cheese in France, durian is precious in Southeast Asia. Some believe it's worth killing for. Durian trees don't bear fruit until they're 15 years old. A single durian can cost as much as $50 American. Here in Kuching, the capital of Malaysian Borneo, hotels are on the front lines of the durian war. When the fruit is in season, hotel managers maintain a constant vigil to keep it out. For them, the taboo is really about the bottom line. One funky fruit can scare off a hotel full of customers. It goes into the curtains, it, it uh, sticks into the carpet, it sticks into the bedspreads. That doesn't stop people from trying to smuggle it in. We can immediately smell it. And they always deny it, but we know that they've got them. Every hotel has its own method of dealing with the durian alert. There's only two methods of getting rid of the smell that we found. One is charcoal. Charcoal absorbs the smell. And the other, that, that takes quite a long time. And the other one, we've got an ionizer that, um, it's an industrialized one, and within three hours, we can pull the smell out the room. Please, no durians here, not in the hotel. Outside, uh, in the fresh air, you can do it, but uh, definitely not here. In Borneo, visitors can decide for themselves if the durian is delicious or just plain disgusting, as long as they do their taste testing outdoors. So as you can imagine, there's, you know, another 100,000 uh, uh, videos on um, YouTube about this, and apparently this stuff really does taste good. It just really, really stinks. And I have a link to uh, one or two at the end of this um, uh, program.
Okay, so another very important economic uh, plant in uh, this family is uh, cotton, which uh, you wouldn't uh, sort of expect to have uh, a showy little flower like that when uh, the end product is this uh, fluffy bit of fluff. But uh, that's the case. And um, I think one of the more interesting uh, mythological things I've come across recently is um, while um, this was cultivated, you know, um, uh, 6,000, 8,000 years ago um, in India and other places, um, when cotton cloth was brought to medieval Europe, uh, it didn't come along with an explanation of how it was um, produced. And so since people only knew wool, as a, a textile, they assumed that um, uh, somehow or other there were little plants that uh, produced uh, cotton on little lambs that were attached to the plant. And uh, so it was called the vegetable lamb of Tartary. And this gentleman, John Mandeville, um, very knowledgeably wrote about um, how the vegetable lambs were produced. And um, then they would, they would lean down and they would nibble everything around the plant um, to eat. And then uh, when they nibbled everything, then uh, they died and you got the cotton from them. So um, it is a perennial in the US. It's generally treated as an annual. Uh, it's subject to enormous amounts of um, uh, insect predation. And so um, it ends up being easier to just um, uh, knock it all down and start over. It went through a long history of um, the uh, uh, labor to pick it and clean it being so uh, high that uh, slavery in more than one place was developed around the production of cotton. Uh, it was hand harvested even in the US until the 1950s. And, uh, but then finally, uh, they figured out how to do it uh, mechanically. It is harvested for both oil and fiber. And today, um, there's over 100 million bales produced with uh, each bale, bale weighing about um, 500 pounds. Basswood or linden, one of my favorite trees. Uh, lovely uh, shaped, little heart-shaped leaves, uh, interesting fruits on them, and uh, interesting little flowers that are, of course, um, miniature versions of uh, hibiscus or something. Um, it can get fairly large, up to 120 feet tall. Uh, attracts a lot of bees. Uh, it uh, makes uh, good bee honey. Uh, woodworkers are very fond of the wood because it's easier. It's easy to make uh, ornate uh, structures. It's not brittle. It can be cut fairly easy. Uh, historically, the inner bark was used for ropes, and additionally, it's um, used for tea and herbal treatments. Hollyhock. Uh, you couldn't talk about um, the Malvaceae without mentioning hollyhocks. There's a bazillion different colors and shapes and sizes of them. Uh, they're very common in the Midwest. Uh, it's a, a nice uh, kind of weedy species. You throw a few seeds down and they tend to reproduce in pretty big numbers for a pretty long period of time. Uh, they are biennial. As far as Iowa natives, hollyhocks are not, uh, uh, that hollyhock is not native to Iowa, but there is a uh, hibiscus militaris is native. It uh, likes to be wet, so you find it around um, uh, swampy areas uh, fairly often. And another one that actually likes to be just baking dry is uh, Calarola and Volucrata, purple poppy mallow. mallow. Um, find it in um, uh, areas where that are just so dry you can hardly believe a plant would grow. Toxicity, uh, oddly enough, uh, cotton is um, uh, fairly toxic. It uh, contains a, a pigment called gossypole that's uh, toxic after long-term exposure, whether from eating or um, consuming extracts. It was uh, uh, tested as a male contraceptive in the 70s and uh, worked really great. Um, you know, very little um, accidental pregnancies. The only problem was uh, it caused uh, a lot of physical side effects and in some cases permanent infertility, so uh, no longer looked at with uh, such favor. Uh, hibiscus tea uh, is sometimes uh, some mild um, uh, toxicity from people who make uh, drinking tea uh, repeatedly from the flowers or the leaves. There is a Cida rhombifolia um, that was used in a lot of ethnobotanical applications for uh, many different um, medical treatments. And uh, in high doses, it can cause some toxicity. For more information, uh, I do recommend uh, Googling durian on uh, YouTube if you want to see a wide range of interesting videos. And uh, for just general information, uh, there's Purdue, um, Hawaii, and Wikipedia, and then a place called Topwalks has uh, quite a bit of stuff about Malvaceae. That concludes the Malvaceae.